Alors, bonjour, messieurs, dames. Bienvenue sur la scène Purple, la scène Violette. Béatrice Noël avec vous comme maître de cérémonie pour cette nouvelle conférence qui va avoir lieu pour 45 minutes. Je vous rappelle que vous devez avoir ce transmetteur pour pouvoir entendre la conférence sur cette scène et que si vous ne l'utilisez pas, je vous invite à la ramener à la table afin de permettre à tout le monde de pouvoir y avoir accès pour assister à l'étape de conférence de la scène Violette et la scène Verte. Alors, le sujet que nous allons aborder pour les 45 prochaines minutes sont les défis des places de marché numérique face à la protection de la propriété intellectuelle. Pour discuter de ce sujet, nous avons la chance d'avoir un panel de trois invités. Je vous les présente à l'instant. Nous avons Melissa Tarsimla... Tarsitano, avocate associée chez Kestenberg Siegel Lipkus LLP, Barristers and Solicitors. Elle est également présidente du comité de lutte contre la contrefaçon de l'Institut de la propriété intellectuelle du Canada. Bonjour, hi. Nous avons également Daniel Roy, CET Sales Team Leaders for Eaton Corporation, qui sera avec nous. Bonjour. Et nous terminons avec Michael Rose, un special agent from the U.S. Homeland Security Investigations. Bonjour. Et pour diriger la conversation, nous avons nul autre que Caroline Hummer, qui est experte mondiale de la protection de l'enfance et également la cofondatrice du Trust and Safety Forum, créé lors du dernier forum annuel de, du FIC à Lille. Alors, conversation de 45 minutes. Nous allons nous garder un petit 5 minutes à la fin pour la période des questions. Alors, la conversation est à vous. Merci. So welcome everybody and uh, we hope you will enjoy the next 45 minutes. Before we go into questions, I just thought I give everybody a quick minute or two to introduce each other and to the, to the audience. So Melissa, if you want to quickly start. Hello everybody. Um, so I am Melissa. I'm an associate with Kastenberg Siegel Lipkes. I'm based in Toronto. Um, my practice deals mainly with trademarks, anti-counterfeiting, cross-border enforcement, um, or border enforcement with respect to uh, counterfeit goods, um, domain disputes, and online and offline investigations and enforcement. I'm happy to be here to talk to you all. Yes, good morning. My name is Daniel Roy. I work for Eaton Corporation for 33 years. Uh, got involved with the counterfeiting, mostly with the uh, model case circuit breakers. Work with the uh, local authorities and also the uh, RCMP to investigate the uh, counterfeiting and the uh, breaker gray market. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mike Rose. I work for the U.S. Homeland Security Investigations, and I work at the uh, the National Intellectual Property Rights Coordination Center just outside Washington D.C. And basically, the IPR center serves as the U.S. government's kind of response to all counterfeiting digital piracy crimes. So it's a task force. We've got law enforcement and industry and academic institutions that all sit with us at the IPR Center and work on solutions to counterfeiting and intellectual property crime. Great. So we've got a great mix of, mix of expertise on stage. And I guess to start off with is, as we're talking about digital market space, and uh, Let's give a little bit of a landscape analysis of what are we seeing in regards to IP infringements in the digital market space. Um, and if you want to start, Melissa, and then pass it over. Sure. Um, I would say that we're still seeing the classic trademark infringement, counterfeit, uh, sorry, copyright infringement, counterfeit goods. There has been a shift with respect to the metaverse and NFTs, which I know has been discussed at this forum. Um, but more often than not, we're seeing these collections that are utilizing brands and rights holders' intellectual property. So it's definitely a different space that um, brands and rights holders have to keep in mind when they are doing their online landscape um, and of course the sale of counterfeit goods is still something that we're that we're seeing widespread on social media especially as um, a lot of applications you know snapchat um, twitter metas so facebook and instagram um, a lot of those those apps are shoppable now um, so there's also that aspect of infringement and you know different avenues to sell counterfeit goods that have to be on everyone's radar mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. And I, I think we all saw kind of around the world, right, during COVID, everybody found a mechanism to buy anything and everything on the Internet. And unfortunately, I think that made it, that opened it up even more to counterfeits on the Internet. And now people are very much, they're comfortable buying anything from a website. And, and to Melissa's point, whether it's a 
a Facebook post or a known store or an e-commerce marketplace, anything and everything is available. Um, and frankly, anything that has a value and can be sold likely will be counterfeited. So it, it really kind of expands the, the risk for consumers and for rights holders and that it's much, it's much more difficult to police now because it's just so readily available. Yeah. And just, to, just yeah. to add, there's also been um, a surge with respect to domain name registration that incorporate, um, you know, different trends. So by way of example, Meta. So it'll be like MetaBrandName.com or um, different TLDs that have become more popular, like .xyz and and those mm -hmm. types of um, infringements that are also happening. So incorporating brand names into domains um, is definitely something that is also more widespread as kind of, as you said, the universe shifted online. So. And, and I think, that, Daniel, from your perspective, as you're, you have products that are being counterfeited, have you seen any change through COVID, with COVID, that, that has made things difficult for you? Well, it's not as much as the COVID or pandemic that has changed. It's mm -hmm. more the accessibility of the web uh, uh, sites that mm -hmm. are reselling uh, our products. Uh, we are putting place some actions to identify the genuine products against what could be a counterfeiting with the low pricing on that we can find on the web. So we're putting some process in place uh, to make sure that the safety of the product is 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 protected. Yeah. And I guess that's a that's a that's sort of coming to, to the next question is around the process of of how are we looking at or what kind of processes should the digital marketplace platforms put in place to be able to navigate the infringements or, or identify these those infringements that are happening? And yeah, Mike, please. So I'll start. One of the things we've done at the IPR Center was partnering with the four biggest e-commerce platforms in the U.S. So Alibaba, Amazon, eBay, Walmart, and basically bringing those four groups together to share information among themselves on the counterfeiters that they're seeing on their particular platforms with the thought that if you're selling, if you have a, counter, a storefront selling counterfeit on Amazon, it's likely that either before or after you get kicked off of Amazon for doing it, you right. will have started a storefront on Alibaba or on one of the other platforms. So um, it's been pretty successful in that basically four competitors are now willingly sharing information among themselves, trying to trying to make the others better at finding the counterfeiters. I think that's a, a huge benefit. Um, so that's, that's one of the, the routes that we've gone. And then also taking those the information on the, the real bad guys from the platforms and using using that information, playing it off of the law enforcement information to see which one of these rise to the level of a criminal investigation. So kind of taking it one step further. But, but in reality, the more of these folks that we can identify and make, make life difficult for them by taking them down off the platforms, um, for selling counterfeit, I, I think that benefits everybody and just mm -hmm. makes makes the whole space just a little bit safer for consumers and trying to find legitimate goods. Absolutely. And to Mike's point, I think it's important that rights holders take advantage of the different you know, tools that are available or that platforms make available because more often than not, you can you know speak to somebody at those platforms or have a contact there, and then you can also use that information in house, even if you're not necessarily sharing it with others. But it's it's important to kind of use as much data that's available to you. Um, and there are also proactive measures, you know, image searching um, and different tools that that they've implemented that really do assist rights holders. So it's just you know you do have to kind of take that upon yourself as mm -hmm. a brand or as a rights holder to see which program is best for you and that kind of goes beyond the traditional notice and takedowns um, and you know the form submissions that are available um, because it's just it's worth it if you are dealing with counterfeit on a, a large scale on specific platforms 
And I, I, I think I like that example, but I think from your side uh, at Eaton, you, you have approached it a little differently with the counterfeiting of breakers um, and how you manage that. So if you want a little bit of explain what your approach was to the counterfeiting in that respect. Okay, the first step we put together was to re revise our uh, aftermarket selling price mm -hmm. so that the maybe the counterfeit breaker would be less attractive for the clientele. And um, we've also uh, worked at putting some special codes on the breakers themselves mm -hmm. so that we can track but uh, they're, they're, they're smart guys, <laughs> so they're doing whatever they, they can to try to make some alteration to the product so that we cannot find the way uh, where the, the, the origin are. Yeah. So in that regard, we work with consultants to make sure that they get the certificate of origin from Eaton Corporation signed by a sales representative from our uh, company. So in that regard, we, we, we work at providing a genuine products to the, the marketplace mm -hmm. and uh, we're getting help from, from the, the industry, let's say. And that essentially also helps in protecting your brand and making sure that people understand Eaton has a certain standard to its breakers. Um, and, and that is really important because that's a marketing aspect of things. And I think that's also something that you and I talked about a little bit of how do companies and platforms that should, or, or consumers be able to protect their brands that are being counterfeited? Um, what should they be looking at to, to be able to stop the counterfeiting or reduce the counterfeiting? With respect to marketplaces, um, third-party marketplaces, I would say vetting your sellers is, is key. Um, but even for consumers, and I know we also discussed this, or we might touch on this um, mm -hmm. in a bit, but even for consumers, it's important to know who you're buying from. Um, so if you know there is a product that is on a website, and you can look at Eaton website and know that you know these are our authorized retailers, or we have these policies implemented. If you're going to uh, you know a, a large third-party marketplace or a marketplace that allows third-party sellers, um, you, you just need to know who you're buying from. So I definitely think vetting sellers is is something that's important. Um, and I know some marketplaces incorporate, we also spoke with um, the ability for consumers to report um, counterfeit goods or Absolutely. goods that they believe to be infringing. So that that is, it does get tricky with that with respect to, you know, allowing other users on a platform to report um, certain infringements. More often than not, you either have to be the rights holder or an authorized representative of the rights holder to do that. Um, but there are some, you know, the Poshmarks of the world or, or the Vinted type platforms that do allow um, consumers themselves to report other sellers um, on the on the space, but it really just, it comes down to knowing who you're buying from, in, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And I guess that's a difficulty as a consumer, so you have to do your own due diligence mm -hmm. to understand, am I buying the right thing? Because it could be anything. I've, I've gone onto eBay and bought clothes over eBay it may or may not be the right thing that I'm actually buying from another person that's another person, another individual. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the tough part because in the end, it, you're taking a risk as a consumer. It's up to you how much risk you want to take. But it, that comes to, to a little bit also, and, and I, th I do want to circle back to the reporting aspect, but before we go there, I do want to talk a little bit about what we're seeing, sort of the trends that you're seeing right now that are the biggest issues for the marketplaces and if you I don't know if you want to start Mike I think one of the big trends that I would like to say that it would eventually go away one day but it doesn't seem to be are like the the lifestyle drugs the Viagra Cialis that type of thing being imported whether it's gray market or just straight counterfeit the amount of that coming into the US is pretty staggering um, I think some of that probably falls on falls on consumers, one, being somewhat lazy, but two, also being uninformed, mm -hmm. and they, they're just not aware of the risks, right? Like, if you're going to put something that claims to be medicine in your body, 
it's probably worth a trip to a legitimate doctor in a legitimate pharmacy to get those drugs as opposed to finding a website, whether it's an e-commerce platform or just any any website that claims to sell medication, and -hmm. yet people will will buy these and willingly take them. And so that's always, always shocking, unfortunately. Um, again, not, nobody wants to hear about COVID anymore, but <laughs> during COVID we saw just staggering numbers of N95 masks, the PPE, the, the amount of counterfeits out there overwhelmed the number of legitimate products, um, which was pretty shocking one the volume but two the speed at which the bad guys were able to to get up to speed is the legitimate companies were ramping up production the bad guys were just exploding but again they don't have to follow the same rules so where a company like 3m has to build everything to standard and they have to get the right machines to do it the counterfeiters they can whatever recycled paper that's fine. Old rubber bands, that's fine too. They're not held to the same standards. So I think that all, it allows the criminals to be a little more agile, mm-hmm. I guess, if that's a good way to explain it. But it's, it's certainly troubling that, that when the criminals see a market, they're able to react much faster because they're not following any of the rules. Right. That means we're all, we, as, as the law enforcement or government and laws are always behind. We're right. trying to catch up, which makes right. it more difficult. And it means that customers, and you mentioned it, the customers, you have to take responsibility for making sure that what you're buying is legitimate. And it's not always easy, but I think there's some telltale signs. To your point about the price difference between the mm-hmm. fakes and the legit pieces, if if you're looking to buy something that should be five hundred dollars and you find it for a hundred and twenty, it's probably going to be fake. You should you should be wary of that. But a, a lot of it again is educating the public on what to be on the lookout for, but also why why they should be on the lookout for it, why it matters. Yeah, yeah. And I guess from from your side, Melissa, I know when we talked briefly beforehand, you you mentioned a couple of trends that. I want to touch upon, um, and maybe you can explain a little bit of what they actually are when you mentioned live selling as well as duping. Yeah. And I know, Mike, you talked a little bit about it too, but if you can a little bit explain what they are and why they're so increasing at the moment. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of um, live selling. So essentially, it's not a new concept. It's been done, especially um, overseas, for a very long time. Um, but in North America, it's definitely... Can you not hear me? Can you, am I good? Oh. Oh. Um, we lost the AV. <laughs> <laughs> Just at this point. Is it back? No. This is my favorite topic. Just when we, when we get to the good part. <laughs> it's easy. It's I have easy. Some stories for uh, you. Okay. Hello? Nothing at all? No. <laughs> mm. No. It's too early for that. Have a nice day, everyone. Everyone is Mike? It's English. It's the English translation that's not. So you could take over, yeah. Daniel, if you like, in French. Français. 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 I know. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I know. With, with the other session. Um, it's ready? too close to lunchtime. That's that what too. it is. Maybe the translators went to lunch. Do you want me to, like, can Shout. they hear me? <laughs> If you all move to the front, then we Does can have work? a real it conversation. Okay. okay, it's working. Okay, so as I was saying, live selling. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, live selling is not necessarily a new concept or a new trend, especially with respect to overseas. But in North America, um, we're seeing a lot of it on 
Instagram, Facebook, and essentially it's when sellers use the live capabilities that the um, applications allow. Um, they go live and some live sales are 20 minutes, some live sales are three hours. Um, and the difficulty with respect to live selling is once the sale is over, most counterfeit groups or groups that sell counterfeit, they get rid of their live sale. So it's very difficult to detect unless you know that a live sale is happening and then you are visiting that platform at that time to make sure that you know, you're know you taking screenshots and you're capturing all that information to enforce. And the beauty of that is we have had instances um, on behalf of some rights holders where we have um, had investigators go on and, and you know take the appropriate screenshots that you, know, you could see that this platform is technically facilitating the sale of counterfeit mm -hmm. and we've been able to submit that to you know Facebook for example and they have action that group or remove that group so there are you know that's a positive with respect to the enforcement side but in terms of um, you know detecting and identifying these sellers it is getting increasingly difficult because a lot of them are also now making their groups private and um, so you're not even able to access these groups unless you are you know a friend of a friend or they know who they're allowing in not working lost it I just hate live selling. <laughs> Lost again. At least, at least you're paying. I, I'm looking at you versus I I, at the audience. Is it back? Good. Back. No. To make it more informal, just bring everybody up on the stage yeah. with us exactly. and we'll all just sit around. <laughs> in a circle? That's what I'm saying. This is like we okay. can have a um, perfect. So since... <laughs> No one wants me to talk about live selling. No, I'm kidding. Um, and then there's also dupe influencers. So with respect to dupe influencers, um, which a lot of them, we have encountered a lot of dupe influencers that do in, you know, engage in live selling. But essentially, what I mean by dupe influencers are people that are um, advertising goods or links to products that are as close to the original as they can get. So. The issue with this is there are you know certain demographics that love that. They know that they're buying counterfeit, they have no issue, but when you find a dupe influencer, their entire platform is based on sharing these links that, um, and Mike, you can even speak to this, where you're, you're getting, you're not getting what you are purchasing. So, you know, you're looking at a listing and it's a t-shirt, but then you're getting something branded or a branded hoodie, or you're looking at a cosmetic pouch, but then you're actually getting a Louis Vuitton handbag. So that's something that, you know, it's kind of like the evolution of a hidden link seller, but they're in plain sight because they're making it clear that you are getting a dupe. So you are getting something that is not the original. And that's, that's another big trend that we're noticing. And and yeah, to your point, they're using they're using the e-commerce marketplaces to facilitate the transaction. So, right, it may have a link to to a platform. When you pull up the picture on that link, it's not what you know you're going to get. Um, but it allows it allows them to have that whole transaction facilitated through Amazon or through PayPal or through one of these other. So, it looks. It looks legitimate, <clears throat> excuse me, for maybe for law enforcement who might be looking, you know, looking at these people for selling counterfeits, but the transactions look legitimate because they're going through a platform such as, you know, through through Amazon or through eBay with PayPal or something mm -hmm. like that. So, one, it makes it easier for them to actually sell it and complete the transaction, but two, it, it makes the money movement look legitimate. Um, which is always a challenge and it's tough for the platforms as you said some of these are up for three hours mm -hmm. or some of the dupe maybe it's a day or two by the time the e-commerce platform realizes something isn't right this cosmetics pouch shouldn't be $150 Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. there's a loose wire somewhere there must be a loose wire somewhere. <clears throat> what does purple stand for? Is it, in, in a, is it back? No. We'll figure something out. Um, any change? 
Não. Não. Still not. When is it? Yeah, it was here yesterday. Yeah. Did it? So just the two sessions that the, that the IPR center is doing are the ones <laughs> yes. that crash, right? The that yes. Fall. The U.S. government is trying to censor the... <laughs> We can speak louder. Okay, great. It sounds like Andrew, but I have my Italian in me like you do. <laughs> So we'll try to speak big in English, but you'll have the French translation, exactly. correct? Well, okay. So we still need so, yeah. so keep into the microphone. Okay. Mike, you were talking about the duping and the, oh, uh, I, the selling. Yeah, just or finishing with, the sites. it just makes it that much more difficult for the platforms because by the time they, they say, oh, this isn't right, the listing's already down. So... <laughs> <laughs> so From that, the diaphragm. <laughs> I don't want to yell into the microphone. Okay, I'll yell into the microphone. <laughs> but so again, even for the platforms that are trying to be proactive with these, some of them come up and go down so quickly that by the time they realize, oh, this isn't right, it's already the link has disappeared and there's no more activity. So it's yeah. it's just it's whack a mole. I don't know that whack a mole translates. It's not, an, <laughs> it's not an efficient way to do it. But, so I guess there are two questions. With the live, with the live selling, is that something that uh, any person could come across on that doesn't know what they're looking for? And if so, what do you do if you then come across that? I mean, I would assume if, I was, if I'm the person that comes across a life selling that I realize is a scam or is, is counterfeiting, what do I do with reporting? What do I, I I'm not gonna shout into the life selling going, yeah. this is, I'm gonna shut you down. So what is the, what are the possibilities of reporting those kind of things if I come across it? Well, when you come across it, it's not necessarily, I hate, it depends, and I hate to say that, but I knew that would come up at some point, but it, it would depend on the type of live sale as well. So a lot of times, you know, like people are looking for these live sales or they've been informed about these live sales. So they're groups. Um, we've had a lot of groups in the Prairie region um, that are connected to massive networks overseas. And what they're, and these are like really small towns in like Alberta and, um, and other provinces that, they all know each other. So their mm -hmm. live sales, they happen at a specific time. They're you know three to four hours long. And then those are the types of sales that are wiped because they don't necessarily need anyone to watch it after the fact because all of their customers are tuning in. It's kind of like the new version of a Tupperware party, right? Where you know everyone gets together, but now they're just getting together in an online forum um, or an online space. But when it comes to reporting, it, it would really, the best case, it, reporting it to Facebook would be difficult because unless you're, like I said earlier, authorized on behalf of the rights holder, it is tricky to even get to the necessary drop downs to fill out a form. Um, but you know, preserving that evidence or taking a screenshot and maybe finding the appropriate party or sending it to the brand. A lot of brands, a lot of rights holders have portions on their website or contact details made available for this type of activity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the same way that they tell you these are authorized retailers, more often than not, they're gonna have a link or some sort of contact detail or person that you can get in touch with um, that you can share this information with. So I would say, you know, to tell consumers if you are you know, witnessing this, even if you're not a victim, you know, if you didn't purchase something, um, it's worth 
preserving it, whether it's on your phone or, or taking a screenshot on your computer, and then sharing that information. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you have, an, at the IPR center, you have a, a hotline or, or some place to report? Yes, we, on our, our website, which is just iprcenter.gov, um, there is, there's a mechanism there that you can, you can click on the, they call it the button, and it says <laughs> report IP theft here. And so you can do it that way, yeah. or there's an email address on there. If you can just hit that, and it goes to one of our program managers who mm -hmm. monitors the, the email box. So that's, that's always a route also. Again, it, it, we're looking at it from a, like a criminal investigation standpoint, so it doesn't always rise to that level. Um, but it's certainly something because of the relationships we have with the platforms that if we get these types of things, we, you know, we'll pass it along to, to Meta or to, to Amazon or to Alibaba Alibaba, to say, yeah. hey, we've, we've had a couple of these complaints about the same type of thing. And they're pretty proactive about doing their own research mm -hmm. to see, like, yeah, we can substantiate what, what you've heard and, and we're going to take action on it. So... And in Canada, there's the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center, and um, thank you for bringing that up, because we have something very similar, um, where you can go to the CAFC website, or even the Canadian Anti-Counterfeiting Network, they'll redirect you. Um, and when you report any sort of fraud, even if you're not a victim of it or, or counterfeiting, um, even if you are not the victim, you can usually navigate and send a report, and then they'll get in touch with the appropriate rights holder um, or representative of the rights holder, and then they'll take it from there. So yeah, it, there's also that um, mm -hmm. Canadian Anti-Fraud Center and Canadian Anti-Counterfeiting Network um, websites that you can visit. And Daniel, from your perspective, is it, do you, uh, as, as a company, do you have an actual reporting mechanism? And then are you co collaborating with the anti uh, fraud network or, or others that yeah if a customer buys a uh, model case circuit breaker and question himself is it a genuine or not we have a special group at Eaton that would uh, help to identify mm -hmm. if it's a genuine make sure that the, the safety of the uh, end user is uh, is maintained so yes we do have a uh, a specific department that takes care of that. And then you work closely with and the we RCMP work then if in, we in find out that it's not a genuine product, we work with the local authorities, which call here in Quebec it's RBQ. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it goes beyond that, the RCMP gets involved and investigate the um, the provenance of the, the product itself. Perfect. And I guess sort of as, as a, before I, if we can do questions from the audience in a way that works, um, I do want to talk a little, go back a little bit about how we as general consumers can look out for. What do we need to pay attention for when we're on Amazon or, or in eBay or Alibaba and we're buying whatever we want to buy? What is it that we need to look out for to say this is this is a scam or this isn't this is genuine? What are there are there particular things that are easy to to for us consumer general consumers to pinpoint that or is it more hidden? I think we touched on this a bit, but definitely price. price. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's a big one. Um, price, quantity. Depending on the type of product, if you know that it's something that, you know, when it comes to luxury or clothing, if it's, if it's a limited run and you encounter a website that's selling 100 versions of something that you know they only made 200 of, that would definitely be something that, that you should mm -hmm. keep in mind. So the product itself and the way in which it, it should be sold or would be sold by the brand, um, that's also something to, that would be a red flag. I, I think the other thing, too, and maybe it's not quite as applicable to the e-commerce platforms as far as finding you know which which of these eight listings on on Alibaba is going to be legit and which might be counterfeit but if you don't know if you're on some other third party site chances are like every company selling a product has their own website and you can probably buy it through there so if there's really a question that's always probably going to be the safest answer, right? What, whatever you're looking for, you can find that company's home website 
and either a list of authorized distributors or, hey, buy it right here. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, certainly Amazon, and I, and I think you can, you can do a little bit more research, to your point, on price or on quantity or on sometimes things will stick out as far as, you know, this is whatever, an office products vendor, but now they're selling handbags and sneakers or things like that that don't match that there's so many options for buying things online i think like for me if i find one thing i'm like this some i'll go find someplace else right there's other options why why take the risk and again clothing is one thing but if you're looking for car parts or you're looking for pharmaceuticals or things that if they go bad can hurt you or kill you why would you ever <laughs> why would you ever take that chance and say well maybe I could save I could save 4.99 in shipping for these brake pads that may or may not stop my car yeah. like for the five bucks just <laughs> go buy the right go buy the right stuff uh, yeah and, and that's always a, sometimes a difficult decision depending on on your financial situations but I think absolutely always try to go to the website of the company and see what their actual prices are before going anywhere else. Um, and that makes a huge difference. So I, I think we have about five minutes and I don't know if the technical issues have been solved, but if there are questions, I, I don't want to dismiss them from, from the audience. It's working? It's working? Okay. Yeah. Um, so if there are questions, I can either pass the microphone down or um, we can also stay behind and ask questions individually if there are any. I know it's lunchtime <laughs> and everybody's getting hungry. Um, so if there are no questions, what I do want to ask is sort of sort of last thoughts from, from the three of you of what is it that you want us to take away from learning about the IP infringements within the digital market space? What, do, what is it that we need to know about all of this? I think from a rights holder's perspective, it's good to um, kind of engage in digital landscapes, like quarterly, let's say, just kind of always know, know the trends, um, stay on top of those trends, even if it's something as little as, you know, this is the hashtag that people are using to find my product or to find the um, counterfeit version of my product. Those can go a long way. Um, I also think it's it's very important as a takeaway um, that, and we didn't touch on this, but to register your marks at uh, with customs, um, customs in the US, customs in Canada. It would It's alarming how many online sellers and online networks have come from those types of detentions and those types of matters. I would say 90% of the supplier information that we get when goods are detained lead us online and some of those has, have actually, excuse me, resulted in um, warehouses being raided overseas. So I would definitely say don't um, don't sleep on customs. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> that's super important to record your rights with um, with customs. And my takeaway would be uh, please don't buy on price only. Yeah. Look for an authorized reseller, mm -hmm. not on the, always yeah. the the websites that yeah. offers the, the lowest price. Okay. It's it, it's for your safety. Especially with breakers. <laughs> Especially with breakers. <laughs> so, yeah, from the rights holder's perspective, to Melissa's point, there are absolutely resources out there. Um, there are some that are a little more difficult to navigate. There are some that are relatively easy. In the U.S., registering with the Patent and Trademark Office and then recording those marks mm -hmm. with CBP, I, it's, it's a two-step process in the beginning. I think CBP charges maybe $100. But after that, as you renew with PTO, it renews with CBP. It's once you've done it, like it's a very easy step for a lot of protection. So as a rights holder, be proactive. And if you think you need more or you're running into issues, there are, there are law firms, there's the IPR center, there's all of these resources, but you have to be proactive. Yeah. If, you, if you have a product that people are buying that has a market, that has a value, bad guys will try to sell counterfeit versions of that. Whatever your product is, whether it's a video game or it's brake pads or cosmetics, it does not matter. If there's a market for it, bad guys will sell a fake version and try to undercut you and steal your, yeah. steal your, your money. 
So is a brand hold, you just have to be proactive. Right. And it, that gave me to another question, but I'll leave that for later on over lunch because I think it will be interesting. Um, but I think we will conclude now, yes, if that's... Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I heard the alarm go off. Then, thank you, Caroline. Merci beaucoup à Caroline. Je vous représente nos, nos conférenciers pour aujourd'hui. Donc, nous avions Melissa Tarsitano, nous avions Daniel Roy et Michael Rose. A big, big thank you for the conversation. Donc, si vous avez des questions, oui, on peut applaudir.